Good afternoon. This is GE6102, the contemporary world. Today's topic is about the global city, which uh, we would like to introduce the development of global cities. That um, this topic will highlight the present condition of the world that contributes to globalization. Now for the learning outcomes, at the end of the module, you are expected to understand the global city thesis, identify the attributes of a global city, and analyze how cities deserve, serve as engines of globalization. The 21st century, which is the hub for the closer relations of uh, nations and uh, gives a wider perspective in technological development. Now we can say that the world is a web where people can um, witness or experience the interconnectivity of nations. So it is globalization that really made the nations closer to each other. Now, according to a theorist named by Thomas Friedman in his book, The World is Flat, there are three stages of globalization. The first stage is uh, called the Globalization 1.0 that lasted from 1492 to 1800. That uh, he described that uh, shrank the world from a size large to a size medium. This is known as the age of mercantilism and also the age of uh, colonialism in which the driving forces were the workforce, the horsepower, the wind power, and eventually the steam power. Now the second stage is the age of the Pax Britannica. It was uh, Great Britain who was the power in terms of trade and economy. It is known as the globalization 2.0, where the driving force was the new institutions, particularly the, the global markets and the multinational corporations. Now the third stage is um, called the Pax Americana. This refers to when the United States of America became in power in terms of security, trade, um, of course, economy. And actually, this is called the globalization 3.0 um, because um, after the fall of Soviet Union, in the 1980s. So the United States of America became the, the sole or the only superpower. Okay, so unlike the 19th and 20th century, no, the present condition does not use the tactics of force or shall we see the military aspects as a primary strategy in maintaining one's uh, superiority or one's influence over another state. But uh, present condition uses uh, soft power to retain one's um, power or dominance over the less powerful nation or state. So soft power, according to Joseph Nye, uses a different method to establish cooperation or attraction. 
okay um this form of uh, power arises from attractiveness of a country's culture political ideas and uh, policies also joseph nice said that uh, it will be a mistake if a country does not use this uh, as part of its national strategy and he said that attraction has always been more effective than force or the military aspect like attraction in terms of the shared values such as uh, democracy human rights and individual opportunities which are highly persuasive and so we can say that the united states of america has been using this uh, tactic it's a super or the soft power in various ways and now with the development of technology corporations around the world try to expand their network outside their own countries and some environmentalists explain that the world is uh, changing dramatically and there are actually some driving forces in the in the global change and uh, one of the driving force of the global change is the emergence of the interconnected global economy that um, is actually used um increasingly operates as a whole entity now when we say interconnected global economy we're talking basically of multinational corporations which uh they play a substantial role in the global economy and the multinational corporations basically are enjoying their privileges um with their access to to huge amount of wealth or money that they, they were able to draw from their income and uh, um so from these established premises the multinational companies one can say that multinational companies play a pivotal role not only in the global economy but also in the international political economy community as well and um also they were able to to stay in themselves in terms of their capacity and they were able to influence the international community so in a sense we can say that the multinational companies seem to tie the together the politically separated and uh, and the vague world can we say that or the clouded world so yes the the products and the goods of these uh, multinational companies have the really the capable capability to attract a target market regardless of where you are or regardless of the geographical location and regardless of the political ideology so in other words multinational companies have the capacity to erase and transcend the borders of the world um from this figure you, you might be one of those uh user or who enjoy the product by one of these multinational companies for example um you are a fan of a nike shoes that you only see nike shoes over the internet um the design and uh, you always look forward that the design would uh, be available in sm for example or when in robinson's and understands but but you know because of the interconnectivity elsewhere you can able to order that particular type of um, design of shoes that that you'd like that that you only see over the internet or over the their website and that you can order that through online and so yes regardless of the geographical location um they were able to attract their target markets now the multinational and the 
continuity of the nation states acts as the key actors of the global community. And so because of this, we can say that the world seems smaller and more connected. No, not in terms of size, but because uh, uh, you were able to connect with, uh, well, in terms, for example, of uh, buying goods from the multinational companies, or it could be connecting to a friend or a relative elsewhere abroad. That is a figuratively saying that uh, the world is becoming smaller. And uh, yes, we are more connected. And the evidence of such connectivity is the concept and the actual manifestation of the global city. So we can say that the global city serves as a hub for production, for money and finance, for and telecommunication centers, servicing and financing international trade investments and headquarters operations. So um, some theories outline the different characteristics of globality that maintain its link to globalization. And some of the obvious characteristics of a global city could be um, any of these. And also to add could be cultural diversity of the people, the existence of the center of economy, the geographical dispersal of economic activities that uh, marks globalization and the global rich performance. So these are actually uh, seen or observed in famous global cities, such as uh, New York, Tokyo, Singapore, and Seoul. And according to the 2019 Global Cities Outlook, here are the top 10 cities around the world with a comparison um, from 2018. So 2019, London was number one, followed by Singapore, and then San Francisco, Amsterdam, Paris, Tokyo, Boston, Munich, Dublin, and Stockholm. But in 2018, it used to be San Francisco was the first, and London who used to be third is a First in 2019. Now, um, global cities, uh, they have the industry that promote the globalization of the market. And uh, yes, um, the development of the global condition, the cultural diversity of markets among countries arise. And uh, there are basically uh, some general criteria based on why one was considered among the top 10. So basically the general criteria would be the business activity, the human capital, information exchange, the cultural experience and uh, political engagement. And so we can say that the term global city is rooted in basically in economics. And um, there are some functions of global cities. So based on the general criteria, they are uh, highly concentrated command points in the organization of the world economy. There are the key locations of finance um, and some specialized service firms where there are sites of uh, production, including in innovation, or they are markets for products and uh, innovations. Um, also were produced. And so we can say that the global city is just a balance of uh, pillars of urban life. And uh, There are some attributes, okay, that uh, would say that uh, one would fall and be called a global city. So number one on the list is its economic attributes. 
global cities are the hubs of the global economy. We've been talking about that. And no city is a global city unless it is an economic powerhouse, dominant in money or finance, um, in trade, in manufacturing, or business services. Um, we've mentioned about cities such as London or New York. They have the command for several economic sectors. Okay. Also, a global city um, attribute could also be the size. One would say that there is no city under a million people. But uh, San Francisco is a small city, but it, it is a tagged as a global city and a Zurich, for example. But they are included in some listings, but there are exceptions. But uh, otherwise, aside from that, global cities are real, real big cities where 3 million people or more based on the category or criteria. And, and, and so, yes, it, it takes size to offer all the attributes needed to be a global city. But take note that there's really an exception. Well, San Francisco and Zurich is uh, an exemption in a positive way. Even they do not fall under a 3 million population, they still uh, um, fall on the category of a global city based on the general criteria. But some of the world's best cities like, or world's biggest cities like Manila, Cairo, Mexico City, they cannot be called a global city and they may never be widely accepted as of now based on the general criteria so another attribute of a global city is actually it's a human capital so when you say human capital this means they have a number of smart educated and creative people and the percentage of the population with a college degree counts. So does the number of universities and, and the quality of the school or the university. And so the number of international student population or the student international student population counts also, along with the number of the foreign professors and researchers. So, any global city must understand the outside world and they should have links to it. So in other words, a global city should have the ability to attract brains or excellent people from around the world. Another attribute basically is the K-12 education. Because uh, at the upper wage end of the social economic scale. This means good schools for the children of global citizens. So entrepreneurs and investors will not like their children get a bad education. And um, another one is the foreign born residents. So these um, are tied to human capital and there should be a number of foreign born residents to be tagged also or to be included as a, a code, a global city. And you know, some expats or expatriate professionals living abroad for a job for a few years. Um, this counts uh, as a, could be a foreign born resident. And, and, you know, these uh, expatriate professionals, um, they are moving from one city to another, and they are actually a source of knowledge of best practices from around the world. That's why they are tied to human capital. And so large immigrant populations are more often poorer and less educated but they are both cause and effect of urban vitality and so when they go to global cities because that's where the jobs are and once they are there 
then they are the new blood and uh, they tend to to belong to and and be part of the culture speaking of culture it is also um, one attribute because the culture is cause also a cause and effect of a global city why because a strong economy can pay for museums universities symphonies and theaters that make a city more than a pool of labor because culture or this can draw global citizens who have actually uh, a palette of places to live, work, and do business. But high culture is only a small part. So, well, technically, good restaurants are crucial as well. So are the recreation sporting events. And so global citizens will go to the place where their brains and education can be best used, but they, they also want um, to have fun as well. Another one is tourism, because global cities are so big, so vibrant, so much fun. Um, they are magnets for tourists. And so tourists themselves are actually a major export industries because they come from outside to buy what a city has to offer. Oh, so having seen, for example, the, the city, or the global city first and then, then they, they can take the impression when they go back home and uh, they create actually uh, a buzz um, that any global city needs and they serve actually as a um, the market the marketing people to promote uh, what's in with that uh, particular global city Another is the political engagement. This is the interaction between the city's political structure and the rest of the world. So obviously national capitals have an advantage because they have the embassies, and they have the international organizations. But of course, connectivity is also a factor because uh, this means air and digital connections to the rest of the world. So a global city should have major airports with a full schedule of non-stop flights to other global city. Also, globally attuned local leadership. So a global city should have really uh, the best city official. And the city officials must understand that their city's place in the global economy. Think of New York, think of San Francisco. That, um, of course, you would know the officials. Try to research on the city's officials, then they would know that uh, they sell their global focus to to voters for whom all politics may be local. And most definitely, the quality of life. This would include the accessibility to public transit. This also include the environment the safe environment or the safe streets. Um, the global city should offer good health care and the global city should offer efficient and honest local government. Well, a reputation for corruption, pollution or crime will damage a city's competitive power. And uh, here are basically some of the cities which have the best quality of life based on the 2019 survey. So that says Zurich, Switzerland, Wellington, Copenhagen, Edinburgh, Vienna, Helsinki, Melbourne, Boston, San Francisco, and Sydney. And lastly, um, so one of the attributes also is the national political and economic climate. So we know that global cities attract, um, aside from human capital, or at least attract businesses as well. And so global cities are affected by the national policies. So global corporations deal with, with the national laws, also on trade, on currency, 
on export on infrastructure investment and policy so this calls for the global investors seeking business friendly environments and that really fall on the national political and economic climates and so that's it that's all about the topic for the day which is a global city